asleep last night. So if you fall asleep, I might too. <laughs> we're, we're in this um, Okay, so I want to talk about um, two computational problems. I want to talk about computing isogeny between super similar curves, and I want to talk about computing their endomorphism rates. And the reason I want to talk about them together is they're actually uh, equivalent problems. So this will be mostly expository. I'll, I'll mostly be talking about why these two problems are related and then uh, sketch, a, sketch a reduction between the two. Um, so first, the, the reason, what did I, uh, oh, I think I have the hand up. Anyways. Um, so the, the reason we we're interested in this problem of computing isogeny between two similar the curves is, as we saw in the last talk, it, it, uh, we need this to be a hard problem for Post quantum security of this isogeny based crypto, uh, crypto system. So, um, uh, at the, the summer school, we learned about CSI, we learned about SIDH, and in both of these protocols, the underlying hard problem is computing an isogeny between two specified super similar curves. Um, so, I should say uh, the, the, the stuff I'll talk about in this talk really pertains to SIDH or maybe the hash function of Charles Warren Ladder are not really uh, C-side. Um, OK, so what are, uh, what are isogenies? Um, so isogenies are a uh, morphism of elliptic curves. There's an isogeny between two elliptic curves. is a morphism of curves, which is surjective, so it's not a constant for me. Um, and uh, it should also induce a group homomorphism on the, uh, on the uh, k-bar points of the curve. So it's both the morphism of curves and of groups. Um, so every isogenies kernel then is a finite subgroup of your points. And this uh, basically lets us identify um, isogenies with their kernels. So in, the, in, in David's talk, we saw that once you know the kernel of an isogeny, once you specify its kernel, you can compute corresponding rational maps, or rational maps for that isogeny. Um, so uh, when I talk about isogeny graphs, I'll come up again. Um, and what about uh, endomorphism rings? This is the other object of interest for us. So an endomorphism um, of an elliptic curve E is just an isogeny curve itself. And uh, for me, the endomorphism ring is going to be the full endomorphism ring. So all endomorphisms um, defined over the algebraic closure of okay. K. Um, and it's a ring because uh, you can add two endomorphisms um, by uh, pointwise uh, addition and um, multiplication is just composition. And so for an elliptic curve, um, because every isogeny has a dual isogeny, and so every endomorphism has a, a, a dual endomorphism, this gives us an involution on the endomorphism algebra. It narrows down the, the possibilities for what the endomorphism ring can be. So it, it's actually always either rank one, two, or four as a, as a Z module. Rank one doesn't happen for finite fields. So we're interested when in the endomorphism ring is as big as possible. So these are, uh, these are what you call um, super singular endomorphisms. So uh, an elliptic curve over a finite field is, is super singular. If it's endomorphism algebra, what you get just by tensoring with Q uh, is a quaternion algebra. Um, so uh, we, can, we can actually um, say some things about super single elliptic curves. It, it turns out um, their J invariants are always in FP squared. So uh, even over FP bar, there's only um, finitely many uh, super singular J invariants. And um, there's P over 12 in the top end. OK, so those are super singular elliptic curves. We're, we're going to be interested in computing these endomorphism rings. And we're going to be interested in computing isogenies between them. And maybe the first uh, connection between these two ideas comes from um, isogeny graphs. Um, so uh, what are isogeny graphs? Well, one way to think about super singular isogeny graphs is um, we're going to pick a, uh, or maybe, maybe specify an isogeny class and then pick one super singular elliptic curve for every J invariant in that, um, 
by Sajde class, and then we are going to connect two curves E and E prime with an edge if there's an isogeny of degree L between them. So the degree of, an, of such an isogeny is just uh, the size of its kernel. Um, and there's a little bit about identifying isogenies if they differ by post composition with an onomorphism. Um, we're going to think of them as only being one edge. So for example, we would identify B e and negative B. E. Um, okay. Uh, so again, our vertices are super singular J variants, and then our edges are uh, degree L isogenies between curves of that uh, J invariant. Now, there's a lot, a lot we can say about um, these super singular isogeny graphs. Um, I think most of this is work of uh, Deezer and Viara and uh, so, um, right, so how many vertices does this thing have? It is a finite graph. Um, because we know there's only p over 12 many super singular j invariants, and our vertices are super singular j invariants. Um, and it's uh, L plus 1 regular in the sense that the out degree of every vertex is going to be L plus 1, and that's just because there are L plus 1 many non trivial cyclic subgroups of your L torsion. Right? The L torsion is C mod L cross C mod L. We get L plus one many uh, cyclic subgroups, and each subgroup determines an isogeny of degree L, uh, just by taking that subgroup to be the kernel of your L isogeny. Um, more interesting is it's uh, connected. So the way to interpret this is actually every pair of super singular elliptic curves, uh, for every pair of super singular elliptic curves over FT squared, or uh, I mean, as long as you allow, okay. So between every pair of super singular electric curves, there is an isogeny of L power degree between them. And you want to think of this L power isogeny then as just being a path in the isogeny graph. And you get the L power isogeny just by sort of composing the L isogenies, which are the edges in the graph. Okay, so it has P many vertices, uh, but actually there are short paths between them. The diameter of this graph is, is, log, is done by log P. Um, and also, these, these graphs were one of the sort of first um, infinite families of, of Ramanujan graphs. Uh, so I won't be talking about that in, the, in, in this talk, but um, they definitely make them very interesting uh, objects. So again, for SIDH, uh, it, the, the secret key is, say, a two-power isogeny. So we're thinking of that two power isogeny then as being a um, path in our two isogeny graph, for example. Um, for now, I'd, I'd like to, uh, oh, here's a picture. Here's, here's a, a picture of the uh, G of 157.3. So this is the, uh, uh, the three isogeny graph. You can see all, all of the, I guess if you count right with the loops, all of the um, degrees are, of every vertex is four. Um, so this isn't, this is like maybe not actually a graph, it's a multigraph. You can have multiple edges between uh, vertices. Um, you do have self loops sometimes. Um, but there we go. So that, that's the, the sort of contrast between um, super singular isogeny graphs and ordinary isogeny graphs. There's no volcano structure or anything. I mean, in some sense, they're, they're sort of, uh, they're sort of random in a way. Uh, Okay, so what about um, anamorphisms? Well, so uh, the first, uh, as far as I know, one of the first algorithms for computing super singular anamorphism rings um, was in Cole's thesis. So his idea was if you want to compute the anamorphism ring of a super singular elliptic curve, which remember is rank four as a Z module, you need to find four linearly independent anamorphisms. And uh, what you can do then is try to find cycles in this isogeny graph. Uh, so, the pointer, so maybe this is our elliptic curve, which I guess was labeled 10. Um, if, I, if I walk along this cycle, I get back to my curve, and if I'm thinking of composing the um, isogenies, which are the edges in the graph, then once I get back to that vertex labeled 10, I have a endomorphism of that, of that curve. 
And if I maybe find a second one, which is the red one, which I guess I call um, beta, um, then uh, I, I could hope that um, the four elements, uh, one, so the identity map on D, and then alpha and beta, and then their product, so just the composition of alpha and beta, I could hope that this thing is ranked for as a um, C module. Well, basically, as long as you don't do something silly like walk around the blue one this way and then walk around the blue one that way, uh, you'll get actually two linearly independent endomorphisms, and then the product as a consequence will be um, independent of the first three. Um, but what's pretty interesting is uh, once you find once you find this order, um, it may not be the full endomorphism ring. So I think. Uh, I mean, I've sort of suppressed all of the curves that I was representing these vertices with and all of the choices of isogenies, but um, this, this thing uh, actually, actually wasn't, wasn't the maximal order. So um, even if you find these uh, sort of four linearly independent elements um, in the endomorphism ring, you may not get the full maximal order. And um, this is sort of what's happening in, uh, with ordinary curves, right? In the ordinary case, you basically always know a finite index suborder of the endomorphism ring. And the whole game is trying to do ordinary endomorphism rings. The whole game is calculating that index, right? You always know you have to join genius in your ordinary endomorphism ring. The question is, you know, what is the what is the index of that in the in the um, Okay, so at least this, this gives us some inkling of an idea of if we were able to compute isogenies efficiently, we can compute endomorphism rings. Um, but I think the, the reverse uh, reduction is interesting too, but um, for that we need, um, we need um, some more background. Um, that's, that's where we're going, is that these two problems, uh, so I'll just state it right now, but the, that's where we're going, is these two problems should be equivalent. So I should have said in the beginning, um, this is joint work with um, Kirsten Eisentrager, um, Sean Algren, uh Kristen Lauder, and uh, Chris Dock T. Um, the, uh, uh, the two problems we're interested in are um, pathfinding and GMPL, and also computing supersingular endomorphism rings. And what I'll do now is show you how uh, computing endomorphism rings is going to let you pathfind in the isogeny graph. Um, Uh, so for that, um, I don't know, I thought I would give, like I said, I'll try to keep it expository. So we will be using quaternion algebras quite a bit in all of this. So what is a quaternion algebra over Q? Um, well, every quaternion algebra over Q uh, is specified by two generators, I and J. Um, and then uh, it's given by this multiplication table. So I squared is A, J squared is B, and then I times J is maybe JI. Um, so the, maybe the turning algebra you're familiar with uh, would be like the Hamiltonians, which would be h of negative one, negative one, by i squared is negative one, j squared is negative one. Okay, so I mentioned um, the endomorphism ring has an involution, so what's the involution on the quaternion algebra? It's just sort of the natural extension of complex conjugation, but in the context of this, you should think of this involution as just as being taking the dual isogeny. Um, so in, in, in particular, uh, the, the norm becomes, um, the norm of an element is just its degree as a, as a norm, it's just the size of its kernel of this is a Okay, so um, this is the notation I'll be using. H of AB, just the A stands for what I squared is, the J squared is, uh, uh, the B stands for what J squared is. Um, cool. Uh, and so a, a little bit more just on the theory of quaternion algebra so that we can actually nail down what the endomorphism algebra of the supersingular elliptic curve is. Um, there's this, there's this no notion of splitting and ramification of quaternion algebras over the rational numbers. So um, let's say we take a uh, place of our, uh, our field Q. So B is either a, a finite prime P or it's the the, the real absolute value, and then we complete the rational numbers at that place. So we either get a p field or we get the real numbers. 
we could then extend our coefficients with this local field and ask uh, what, what type of algebra do we get when we do that. Um, so it turns out there's only, there's only two types of, uh, well, so anyway, so if we, if we, uh, we, we say that the algebra is split at this place if you get a matrix algebra, and it's ramified if you get the division algebra. Um, so just for example, uh, H of negative one, negative one, you tensor that with the real numbers, like I said, you get the Hamiltonians. So we would say that H of negative one, negative one is ramified at, at infinity. Um, and then one that'll come up in an example later, later um, if you have a prime which is three mod four, then um, H of negative one, negative P is ramified exactly at uh, prime P and at infinity. So if you were to um, tensor this with uh, QP, you get a division algebra. If you tensor it with R, you get a division algebra. If you tensor it with any other, um, any other condition of Q, you um, will just get a matrix algebra. That's uh, what splitting and ramification is. Um, so there is so what then, uh, what, what then is the structure of this quaternion algebra that we have? So if you have, if, if E is a super singular elliptic curve, um, I define that to be an elliptic curve or a finite field whose endomorphism algebra is a um, quaternion algebra. Well, then the, um, the, the places where this algebra ramifies are exactly the prime P, uh, which is the characteristic of your base field, and uh, the the and the end of infinity, and nowhere else. Um, and so that's the endomorphism algebra. And then again, like maybe in further contrast with the ordinary case, the endomorphism ring actually always sits inside the endomorphism algebra as a maximal order. Um, so there's uh, maybe a, a couple of inter interesting things about that statement, which will which are sort of relevant uh, to this discussion. I, I'm saying a maximal order there. In, in these non-commutative algebras, you can have more than one um, maximal order. Uh, and maybe even worse, these maximal orders can be non-isomorphic. So uh, there's, there's maybe a lot more going on in a turning algebra over Q than there is in a, in a number field. Or maybe rather I should say it's just more complicated. Um, and again, in the ordinary case, we know that the endomorphism algebra is an imaginary quadratic extension of Q, um, but the endomorphism ring doesn't have to be maximal, and the whole game is computing its index if you're trying to compute ordinary uh, endomorphism. Um, okay, so maybe just like one concrete example of all of this sort of together. Um, let's take P to be just any prime which is 3 mod 4, and let E be the elliptic curve y squared is equal to x cubed plus x. So um, when P is 3 mod 4, this curve is always super singular. This is the January 17, 28 um, curve. And, uh, so this curve has a uh, automorphism of order 4. So that's what I denoted by E um, here. So by square root of negative 1, I just mean some square root of negative 1 in FP bar, because I want to use I later. Um, it's like sort of notation overload. I'm sorry about that. Um, but if we if we look at if we look at p, um, if you imagine posing p with itself, uh, p squared what is it going to be? It's going to be x comma negative y. But that's exactly in terms of the group law of this elliptic curve. That's exactly a negative the point x y on the curve. So when I square p, I get multiplication by negative one in the endomorphism. And uh, we have this other endomorphism. Uh, this is the Frobenius map. Um, because our curve is defined over FP, this is actually an endomorphism of our curve. Well, what's the what's the characteristic polynomial of Frobenius? It's a super singular elliptic curve, so its trace is zero. Uh, and every um, Sort of every endomorphism satisfies its characteristic polynomial. So its characteristic polynomial is x squared plus its degree. The degree of Frobenius is p. So this, as an endomorphism, satisfies the polynomial x squared plus p. So in other words, you can think of this as being uh, a square root of 
negative p. So let's do that. We'll, we'll identify um, b with i and pi with j, where these are the generators of this quaternion algebra that we saw earlier, h of negative 1, negative p. And this um, identification extends to an um, isomorphism of quaternion algebras. Um, but uh, this, um, this, this order, sort of generated by the identity, the automorphism, e, the endomorphism pi, and then p e pi. Um, this uh, order actually isn't the full endomorphism ring. Um, I mean, in general, uh, if your quaternion algebra is generated by i and j, then the order 1, i, j, i, j is that maximal. So uh, it's discriminant, it's divisible by something which is not a square. Anyways, so this isn't the full endomorphism ring. It's, it's actually indexed to the um, OK, so now let's say uh, we don't just have one super singular elliptic curve, uh, but we have two. I, I want to now sort of draw the connection between isogeny <coughs> and endomorphism rings. So this is all, I don't know what to call it. Like, is it neoclassical? This is, this is work of Waterhouse. Um, so if I have a isogeny from a super singular elliptic curve E to another curve E prime, it's necessarily super singular. And then we know that the endomorphism ring of this super singular elliptic curve E prime is a maximal order in the quaternion algebra ramified at P and infinity. OK, well, we have such a quaternion algebra right here, right? The endomorphism algebra of E is a quaternion algebra over Q ramified at P and infinity. So we could ask then, um, which maximal order in this quaternion algebra is isomorphic to um, the endomorphism ring of our new super singular curve E prime? Um, so what we can do then is we can embed this endomorphism ring into the endomorphism algebra of E sort of by conjugating by phi in a sense. I mean, the, if, if phi is an isogeny, its degree is degree phi, so in some sense its inverse, if you will, is uh, be half divided by its degree. So you, you can maybe think that we're conjugating endomorphisms by this isogeny phi from E to E prime. And so this isn't just an embedding of lattices. This isn't just a embedding of rings. This is actually an embedding of orders in quaternion algebras. In particular, it, it, it preserves uh, taking duals. And that's kind of obvious by inspection. If I take the dual of this whole thing, it's just the image of the dual row. Um, and so uh, this is going to embed the endomorphism ring in the endomorphism algebra of E as a, as a maximal order. And to figure out um, which maximal order, uh, we need this idea of kernel ideals. Um, and so we'll maybe um, see this in the CSIDH uh, talk. I mean, this is sort of how you do these group actions. Um, so if I, if, I, if I have a, an isogeny um, E, I can define a, an, a left ideal of my endomorphism ring of E just by um, taking it to be all of the endomorphisms which vanish on the kernel of E. Um, so this is a left ideal, right? If I uh, post-compose with, if, if I have such an alpha in here and then I multiply on the left by an endomorphism gamma, the resulting thing is still going to vanish on the kernel of P. Um, and its degree is, uh, the degree of P is the, what you call the reduced norm of this ideal. So um, with quaternion algebras, just like with number fields, you can define norms of ideals. And it's defined in exactly the same way. It's the, the ideal of Z generated by all the norms of all the elements with GC of all the norms. Um, and this uh, left ideal lets us figure out what the endomorphism ring is in this endomorphism algebra. So it's what you call the, the um, right order of this left ideal I. So I don't know. Uh, the way I kind of think about a right order is it's all of the elements in your quaternion algebra that make your left ideal into a right ideal instead. And so if I was a left ideal of a maximal order, then you get a um, another maximal order when you take its, its, its right order. And 
it turns out this is actually equal to the image of our embedding uh, I/O. So this is this is maybe the the reason why you would think that um, computing, like theoretically, this is the reason you would think that computing and endomorphism rings is going to help you compute isogenies because you can use the arithmetic of your endomorphism ring to get your hands on uh, isogenies. So we can do this correspondence in reverse. If I start with the left ideal, uh, whose norm I'm going to say is co-prime to P, so that I don't have to say scheme. Um, it's, it, it defines a, a this finite subgroup of the points of your elliptic curve, which is just the intersection of all the kernels of all of the elements in your left ideal. And so all of these things are finite subgroups of your elliptic curve, so their uh, intersection is a finite subgroup of your elliptic curve. Um, and therefore, like I said in the beginning, if you have a finite subgroup, you get an isogeny from it just by quotienting by that subgroup. Um, so that's what I'm denoting by phi i. It's just e to e mod e of i. And its uh, degree is actually equal to, uh, well, it's um, actually equal to the reduced norm of this ideal. So norms of ideals and um, degrees of isogenies uh, corresponding to those ideals match up just like they matched up in the, in the other direction. And if you start, say, with an isogeny, from the isogeny you get its kernel ideal, and then if you uh, compute the corresponding isogeny from that kernel ideal, you get the same isogeny you started with. So uh, these are inverse constructions. So this is sort of what we'll want to do. We'll, we'll want to use this structure of the, uh, we'll want to use this, these left ideals of our endomorphism ring to help us compute isogenies between super and super variables. Um, so let me just uh, specify these, these problems um, now. So the, the one for, the, for SIDH, like I said, we're interested in, um, is the following. You're given two distinct, distinct primes, P and L. You're given two super singular elliptic curves, find over F squared. Then your task is to compute an isogeny between them whose degree is some power of L. So this isn't exactly like the thing you want to break, break SIDH, because here I'm basically allowing the, I mean, SIDH that you know what the degree is supposed to be rather than just, it's a specific power of L. Um, okay, anyways. Uh, and maybe, since we're interested in polynomial time reductions between these two problems, um, I should point out that this problem um, always has a uh, output or an answer or whatever of size polynomial and log P, it, it, as long as your prime L is size log P. And that's um, just because of the in fact, I mentioned earlier that the diameter of the isogeny graph is a uh, size log. Um, and now maybe something that requires a little bit more um, specification. Uh, what do I mean by compute an endomorphism ring? Well, we, we could take it as like this, the following problem. You're given a super single elliptic curve. Compute, the endomorphism ring is a sort of a geometric object. Compute or, you know, honest to goodness, and the morphisms of your super singular elliptic curve and return that as a basis. Um, but uh, what it turns out, all you really need is to know the, the, the sort of Turnian algebra structure. So instead, um, let's fix one Turnian algebra, say specified by its basis in the multiplication table, which is ramified at, P, uh, ramified at P and infinity. So that's all to note e P infinity by. Um, and uh, the problem is you're, you're given a super single elliptic curve um, over FP squared, and you need to compute a maximal, a compute an order in um, P infinity whose endomorphism ring is isomorphic to that order. So the output, say, should be a uh, basis of O, and each basis element of O should be like a Q linear combination of your basis for BP infinity. For example. That's what I mean by compute an order. Um, but maybe one point to make is, so I, I want to I reduce the problem of computing isogenies to, to this problem of computing um, maximal orders. 
And uh, for this, for for like a for a polynomial time reduction to this problem to make any sense, it's important to know that if if we're given an oracle for this problem, something that will just spit out answers for us, we need to know that it can like print its answer in polynomial time for a polynomial time to make, for a reduction to make any sense. Um, and this is, I don't know, I, I don't think this is obvious that uh, that endomorphism rings have polynomial size or that these uh, maximal orders have polynomial size, but they do. So I don't know if I should call it a theorem or a lemma or a, a remark or whatever, but that's the content of this of this statement that um, if you take any isomorphism class, which is just a conjugacy class of maximal orders and deep infinity, then there's at least one order in that conjugacy class. Um, the size is polynomial and log. Um, so I'm not saying that every maximal order has polynomial size. I'm not saying that anything like that, but there's at least one. And so we can at least ask that we have an oracle which sort of returns a, um, an order of polynomial size for us. And the, just a sketch of why this is true. Um, so so, so Pizer shows there's um, at least one maximal order of polynomial size. And then the idea is, um, I mentioned that when you take right orders of left ideals, you get new maximal orders. So it turns out this map is actually surjective on the level of left ideal classes to conjugacy classes of orders. Um, so every, every conjugacy class of maximal orders um, will have an element which is the right order of a left ideal. And then uh, to sort of finish it off, um, because we have a definite quaternion algebra, um, this is sort of the analog of like Minkowski's theorem um, for number fields. But uh, every every ideal class, uh, or every class of left ideals has a has a representative um, whose norm is of size say p squared. Um, so maybe you need a little bit more from this to actually get down to saying that the coefficients are. Um, bounded by some polynomial in P, but this is the, the main idea. Um, so I just wanted to sketch that to show you sort of how, like, like what sort of facts do we need about for the you know, to think about this problem. Um, okay, so the there's been previous work on this, so um, we now can sort of interpret our entire problem in quaternion algebra land, uh, in a sense. So um, this is going to be an important part of our reduction, um, uh, is a solution, a polynomial time solution to this problem. Um, so if you're given two maximal orders in deep infinity, so you should think of this as being you're given two super singular endomorphic rings. Your job now is to compute a left ideal the first one whose right order is the second one. Um, so again, orders more or less are curves, and left ideals more or less are isogenies. So this is the sort of quaternionic version of um, the isogeny, the isogeny problem. And so Cole, Lauder, T. and uh, gave a polynomial time algorithm for this. Um, yeah. So you can Oh, yes, I thought I maybe I gave myself the unupdated slides. Oops. Um, yeah, so it, that's what I fixed yesterday. Uh, the norm of this ideal should be some power of L. Thanks. Yeah, sorry. Um, this means that there are all the other things going around. Which hopefully I'll leave it there. Um, so it's like not it's not like categorically equivalent just because uh, two you could have two non-isomorphic curves whose endomorphism rings are still isomorphic. This happens if their J invariants are conjugate. But anyways, this is more or less the quaternion version of our problem. And this, this problem you can actually um, efficiently compute, uh, efficiently solve. Um, so the, the, the main thing to do then um, is, maybe, maybe I'll go back a minute. Um, so this ideal I, I, I missed it, but I, it should say that its norm is a power of L. Um, we can't do something like just compute E of I, and then there we go, that gives you your isogeny, because uh, the, the number of points 
in this um, kernel, like David was mentioning, these, these kernels can be of cryptographic size. So we can't just compute e of i from our left ideal i. Uh, we have to somehow break it up into a, a path of ideals. Or That's what I'll sort of discuss now. Um, okay, so so this is the reduction I want to sketch. I want to assume we have an oracle for um, computing maximal orders corresponding to super singular elliptic curves. And I want to use this to get a polynomial time algorithm for computing L power isogenies between super singular elliptic curves. So let's say we're given two super singular elliptic curves E and E prime and a uh, prime L. We want to um, specify a uh, L power isogeny between them. And again, the, the thing we're looking for is not one isogeny. We're really thinking about this isogeny as being a chain of L isogenies. Um, so here, this is maybe like the, the, the most uh, simple reduction. You can definitely improve on this, but um, I think that maybe the simplest way to describe it. The first thing we would do is ask our oracle for um, orders O and O prime isomorphic to the endomorphism rings of E and of E prime. Okay? And so now we are in the quaternion world and we solve the corresponding quaternion problem using the algorithm of Kohl-Lauer D and D null. So we uh, get a left ideal I of O whose right order is isomorphic to O prime, and whose norm is the power of L. Um, so we're thinking of now I as being, uh, in, in this correspondence, I is um, some isogeny from E to E sub I. And so I mentioned we want to break this thing up, and what we do is use this filtration of the ideal I. Um, it's, just this simple thing, we're going to define new left ideals, which are just i plus L O and then i plus L squared O, i plus L cubed O. So I1, I1's norm is going to be L. And um, that means I1 will correspond to an isogeny of degree L. So it's like the first step in our path. And then I2 will have L squared norm. So it's going to correspond to like the composition of our first two steps. Um, and so now, uh, then the right orders of all of these uh, left ideals, we can think of as being the um, endomorphism rings of the curves in our isogeny path. So we somehow want to use them as a guide to discern the path we want in the isogeny path. So this is the basic steps. You, you, you move to the quaternion world, you solve the quaternion problem to get your L power ideal I, and then you break I up into this chain of, um, into this uh, uh, ascending, ascending chain of left ideals. Um, compute all of their right orders, and uh, we'll move on from there. So I should say, like all of these things, this is all sort of done just with linear algebra over these, these second two steps. Um, Okay, so, oh man, I spent so much time how to, trying to get arrows to appear and disappear in Pixie, and then I gave myself the handout. This is like really deflated. Uh, <laughs> uh, so this is awful. Um, so the idea is what we're going to do is we start at E, and we're going to compute its neighbors in the isogeny graph. So we get L plus one, so I'm sort of drawing like the two isogeny graph. So there's three neighbors of E, and these arrows. And then we can ask our oracle for the endomorphism ring of each neighbor. There's only three of them, so we, we make three calls to this oracle. Um, and then we can ask which of them is the correct one. We know our next maximal order is the right order of I1. So whichever one is isomorphic, to the right order of I1, we'll pick that as our first step in our path. So that's why I labeled B1. It was so cool, like they were dotted and then they disappeared and then it's B1. But we'll, we'll make do. And then you just repeat this. You now compute the, the two new neighbors of your second curve, ask the oracle for their endomorphism rings, uh, and then pick the right one. And continue like that. 
And so in doing so, you discern a path from, from E in the isotheograph to E sub I. Um, and that'll be the output of our algorithm. But uh, so why am I why am I writing E sub I here and not E prime? Well, uh, it just may not be E prime, and it may not even be isomorphic to E prime. Remember, um, uh, remember this issue between uh, the the, the isomorphic the controversy classes of maximal orders are not in one-to-one -one correspondence with super singular J invariants. They're in one one correspondence with like Galois orbits of super singular J invariants. So it could be the case that we actually didn't land on E prime. We landed on the uh, Frobenius. The we ended on landed on uh, the elliptic curve whose J invariant is J to the P instead of or J prime to the P instead of J prime. But that's totally okay. Um, the idea then is to think all we really need to do is jump from. Uh, EI to EI uh, acted on by Frobenius. And in terms of isogenies, this corresponds to um, this uh, unique two sided ideal in your maximal order of norm P. Um, so what we'll do is compute that thing and now consider the ideal I times P instead of I <coughs> and basically repeat the algorithm. We'll find a L power ideal equivalent to I times P, and then repeat. And now we know we'll get the right, we'll get the, the right curve. Um, there's maybe another issue with how I describe this. Uh, this sort of problem can happen at every step of the algorithm, right? Like at every step, you could um, pick the, you could pick J to the P instead of J. But basically, this means you just need to correspond. Uh, you need to keep track of two paths as you navigate through the. Um, okay, so uh, that's all I have, so thank you. Okay, thank you very much. <coughs> Questions? Comments? Like, 
the idea to figure out what the correct ideal was, or the correct isogeny was to just, uh, in some sense we were using that to compute the by at all these steps, to actually compute these um, kernels corresponding to ideals. But um, I don't know, just thought of a better way to do it. I mean, you really don't need that step, so I didn't want to present something that's like uglier. There's, there's a, another way you can do this whole thing too that's, that's in that paper that's definitely better than the way I just described it. Um, so you can do it with just two calls to the oracle. Instead of, you know, I, I hear uh, the way I described it in a simple way is we're, we're asking the oracle for a whole bunch of enormous amounts, right? Um, but what you can instead do is there's, there's, this, uh, there's this other description of this KLPT algorithm, which is in, I think it's in the Galbraith PT and uh, Silva, I think they run signature schemes, um, where instead of computing an L power ideal, they compute an ideal of power smooth norm. So then what you do is you have your E and you have your ideal I1, and then you're going to compute a power smooth ideal equivalent to I1. And then what's nice about these power smooth norm ideals is you can actually, um, you can actually can compute uh, kernels corresponding to those ideals. So since you can efficiently compute that, um, what you get then is sort of a path from E, uh, not in the L isogeny graph, but in, uh, you have an isogeny graph with a whole, like, a whole bunch of primes, but you sort of wander around and then land up here. And so if you can compute this ideal, uh, or this isogeny corresponding to this ideal, you can write down its codomain. And if you can write down its codomain, then you know the next step in your L isogeny graph. So the so so the idea for that one is instead of making more calls to the oracle, you use this alternative algorithm. But for that one, there's like an entirely different set of heuristics to assume. So I didn't mention at all for this, but uh, the the sort of runtime, the, the fact that this step, um, oops, where am I? The fact that we're saying this step is. Um, is that's the part that relies on this. You sort of have to assume that every norm form for a maximal order, uh, that uh, the distribution of its outputs basically a